Welcome to episode 60 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes and mm, it's been six weeks, six weeks since I arrived back in Britain. Exactly six weeks. Today is Sunday the 16th of October and I arrived back in the UK on, I think it was the 3rd or was it the 4th? I forget anyway. It was a Sunday morning exactly six weeks ago that I finished my Grand Tour, my eight-week trip around Europe. And hopefully many of you, some of you, all of you, I don't know, have listened to the uh, eight episodes of the podcast that I recorded, edited and published while I was on that long tour. Now, if you missed any of them, you can go back and uh, they're all indexed at cyclingeurope.org forward slash le grand tour. Just a quick reminder, part one, that was episode 52, was all about cycling down the Dutch coast, the Eurovelo 12. Episode 53 was about the Belgian and the French coast to Dieppe. And then the Avenue Verte from Dieppe to Paris, that was the Eurovelos 12 and 4. Episode 54 was the Velo Ceni from Paris to Mont Saint-Michel. Episode 55 was the Velo Maritime, again back on Eurovelo 4 from Mont Saint-Michel to Morlaix in Brittany. Episode 56 was me cycling down the Velo Odyssey from Morlaix down to Royan. That was the Eurovelo 1. Uh, episode 57, part 6, was the Velo Route des Deux Mers, which took me from Bordeaux down to Set, and that was along the Canal de la Garonne and Canal du Midi. Episode 58, part 7, was my favourite bit of the entire trip, which was cycling along the Via Rona, the Eurovelo 17, and that was from Set all the way up to Andermatt in Switzerland. And then finally, episode 59 told the story of me cycling down the Rhine, along the Rhine cycle route, Eurovelo 15. And that was published exactly six weeks ago. So if you missed any of those, you can go back and listen to them, and hopefully you will find them interesting, useful, uh, inspirational perhaps, um, if you're planning your own visit to the continent. But this is episode 60, and we're going to return to how it was before episode 52, which is basically me sitting down and having a chat with somebody about something that they've done, which is connected to cycle touring. Now, today's guest, well, I actually recorded this chat last weekend. While I was cycling in France in the summer, one morning got this fantastic email from Laura, Laura being Laura Moss of the Cycle Touring Festival. And she announced that there was going to be a pared down gathering of the Cycle Touring Festival in October of this year. And that took place last weekend. I gave a talk about what I'd been doing over the summer, as did Tristam. Now, Tristam, uh, he embarked on a journey in the UK, a bit shorter than mine. It was just five days. And... Well, rather than me tell you all about it, I think probably the best thing to do is crack on with the interview. Uh, here he is, sitting in the uh, grounds of Waddo Hall in Lancashire, and I started, as I always do, by asking him to introduce himself. Uh, my name's Tris Newey, I'm 48 years old, and I live in a town called Hythe, near Southampton in Hampshire, which is just on the edge of the New Forest. Now we're here at the Cycle Touring Festival, and I've just heard you speak about a really interesting trip. Not a long trip, but a cycle touring trip that was inspired by a particular book. Um, but before we get to that, what's your background in cycling, in cycle touring? Are you a, a long-standing member of the cycle touring community? That's a bit on and off, really. I, I've always been cycling as a kid uh, and did the usual thing that everybody does see, or seems to do when they get their driving license and stop cycling for a few years but uh, uh, back in the late 1990s uh, I decided that just to keep fit and to keep healthy I would cycle to work um, and found an enjoyment in cycling again and uh, for a few years early 2000s did some cycling uh, bought a touring bike um, went to France went around the south of England um, and then stopped again when children came along um, several years out for that and I've just started again uh, with the same bike uh, in the last few years. So what's that bike? 
Uh, the bike I ride, it's a 23 year old Doors One Down, which is very similar to a Galaxy, which many people might know, but it's got 26 inch wheels uh, instead of the usual 700 Cs. But other than that, it's almost identical to a Galaxy. Um, you said you went to the south of France, where did you go? Uh, well, it was in Brittany actually first. Um, so took the ferry from Plymouth across to uh, St. Marlow, I think it was, um, my wife and I. Um, our first sort of proper tour went round Brittany. Um, but since then, uh, back to France uh, more recently to go and do the Dordogne, um, which is a really nice uh, area. So, yeah. Right, so you have been on this tour in the south of England, um, inspired by a book. Um, a book by H.G. Wells, but not The War of the Worlds, which is probably the one that most people have heard of. Can you talk about the inspiration behind the, the cycle tour that you've done? Yeah, so um, in, in funnily enough, in reading War of the Worlds, it, it was more recently, once my children were uh, getting more interested in, in some of the science fiction and, and things, I recommended the book, and uh, as is often the case, you end up reading it to them. Um, and as I did so, realised there was an awful lot of cycling in it um the character in that book was learning how to ride a bike cyclists are, are mentioned several times and it led me to look into why that should be the case and discovered that hg wells the author um was a very keen cyclist in the cycling craze from the late 1890s um and in doing some further research discovered he'd written a book around the same time uh, as the war of the worlds called the wheels of chance a bicycling a bicycling idyll which uh, it basically allowed Wells to indulge in his love of cycle touring. He wrote a book that was effectively allowed him to talk about his learning to ride a bike, um, the social norms and mores of touring at the time and cycling at the time, and uh, yeah, made a, a, a fairly short novel, but one that's packed full of commentary and uh, pointers to the craze of cycling at the time. So. When was when was H.G. Wells? When when was he born, and when did he die? Good question. I can't remember the year he was born. I know he died in 1946, so he kind of spanned that whole period of um, late industrial revolution, modernisation, where uh, technology was really starting to show its potential. And he was a visionary, really, of what was to come. He firmly predicted things like um, flight air, uh, aircraft and how they might be used, particularly in, in, in war. Um, and, but also he, he, was, he had the, an interest in that sort of social change brought about by technology. Um, war of the Worlds itself is, in fact, you know, a commentary about that. But, um, yeah, he, he was uh, a strange career. He was, he was um, at various times an apprentice in a chemistry shop. Uh, and, a, and a drapers um, struggled at school uh, but ultimately succeeded and came back uh, to the school he went to as a teacher um, and uh, then sort of moved on into writing and launched himself as a as a career writer because yeah. there are quite a few of his contemporaries who are who I associate with cycling for example um, uh, Conan Doyle was a uh, was interested in cycling Einstein yeah. was interested in cycling. Um, Jerome K. Jerome yeah, as well. Do, yeah, do, yeah. do you think it was part of that late Victorian psyche of that kind of middle-class man who, who was a writer or an asp aspiring writer that uh, that, was, that, that must have been the, you know, the internet... Of, well, that's perhaps an, an exaggeration, but it was, it was certainly on the the list of things that were cool to be seen to be doing in the late Victorian age. Yeah, and I don't think, I don't think it can be understated, actually, just how much a, a, a significant point of change the bicycle was at the time in terms of giving people the freedom of travel, freedom of movement that was relatively cheap and easy, um, and in bringing people together across various social strata. So cycling um, in the late 1890s really took off in a big way and it was originally very much uh, the, 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 the the indulgence of the, the upper class if you like so um, bikes bicycles pretty expensive things back then but there's uh, there was a bit of you know uh, once 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 people bought them used them for a while they'd either 
moved on to a newer machine or fallen out of love with it perhaps and those second hand machines were made more available to people who, who had uh, lesser means and so although once you're on a bicycle the, the great thing of course at that time was that if you're riding a bicycle you don't know whether you're a duke or a, or a, a draper for example so mm. it leveled those social norms it, it met, brought people together who might nev- not have otherwise mixed um, and I think that's also allowed that freedom to travel and to explore which was uh, quite of interest to people like Wells and his contemporaries who would uh, see it as something of a significant social change or force for change at the time. Yeah, well, it famously also increased the gene pool in terms of um, the health of the population, didn't it? Well, absolutely, and and I think um, I think actually the 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 the, the, the impact on on. Um, on, on the on the people's ability to travel, the people's ability to to meet up with other people and to travel to see and and, and um, engage with others from outside of the area that they lived in is, was was important. Um, and actually, it, it, what is quite amazing as well when you look into the the way the bikes were made of the, at the time, they were quite you know, some of them were, were, were quite cumbersome machines, very heavy. Uh, it's actually amazing the amount of miles that were done and uh, uh, distances that were traveled on what today people would would consider to be something very um, cumbersome and difficult to use mm. compared to modern bikes certainly yeah um it's just a pity that they they invented the car really isn't it it is it is and um and, and no doubt we'll talk about this a bit but of course you know 1890s uh, wells himself points out uh, in his writings, um, that sight riding, learning to ride a bike and, and taking up bicycling then was absolutely, um, it was easy to do because there were no cars on the road. The car, the motor car had recently been invented, but there was really none in, in regular use. So the roads were the purview of the cyclist. You had uh, pedestrians, horses, horse and carts. They were the only machines on the road. The cyclist, uh, literally um, owned the road if you like at the time it was the fastest thing on the road um, uh, short of a bolting horse perhaps but uh, yes no cars so um, a bit of a bit of a bit of a cyclist paradise really now the book that you were inspired by is called uh, the wheels of change wheels of chance wheels of chance sorry and I'm guessing that most people listening to this are like me and whenever they think of H.G. Wells, they think of The War of the Worlds, perhaps one or two other books, but they don't think of this book called The Wheels of Chance. No. Why? It it just got lost, I think, under his other works. He lived in Woking uh, for a short period, uh, I think between around 1894 to 1896, and uh, he was a, absolutely going through a prolific writing period at the time. So uh, he wrote The War of the Worlds, he wrote The Time Machine, he wrote uh, The Invisible Man. All of those are, are really well known, made into films, you know, televised and, uh, and, and, and really known. But at the same time, in that period, he wrote this book called The Wheels of Chance. And it, I think it was just Wells' way of indulging in his passion for cycling. Um, and I suspect he wrote it fairly quickly and, uh, and uh, sort of in, in an in a, in a, in a, in a intense writing session. But... Um, it's just never been really picked up. It's not in print, as far as I can tell, although it's available online now. And, um, yeah, you just don't hear about it. It's uh, a, a bit of a hidden gem. And in terms of the chronology of when he wrote his other books, when, when did he write it? Uh, he wrote it in 1896, which is actually about the same time that War of the Worlds was published. Um, so I, it's not clear exactly when things were, were ordered, everything was done in, but, uh, yeah, about it, concurrently with those, those other works. And was it not picked up by his publisher, and or did they just kind of indulge him um, a little bit after the success of uh, War of the Worlds? Or it was certainly published, but it didn't get much of a print run. Um, there are editions from 1913, but I haven't found anything really since then. Um, I just don't think it had the popularity of his uh, of his other works. I, the, the the science fiction that he wrote was was very much ahead of his time. It was it was really. Um, novel in terms of uh, uh, of what was being produced but The Wheels of Chance itself as a story is quite in line with a lot of other literature being done at the time on in the style of Three Men in a Boat by Jerome, Jake, Jake Jerome, uh, Jerome for example it, it's, it's a kind of mix of 
social commentary, humour, uh, a bit of satire. Um, it, it doesn't really fit in any one genre uh, mm. as such. This, this reminds me, I, I spoke to uh, Tim Moore uh, earlier this year for the podcast and he was talking about how he, he writes books about cycling but he writes books about travelling other than on a bike. And his publishers are desperate to get him to write about cycling because nowadays they sell far better than his, his, his books about when he's not on a bike. But it sounds to me as it was the opposite, perhaps, for H.G. Wells and that, uh, um, you know, hey, give us, come on, come on. What, 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 was it, what, what did the H.G. stand for, by the way? Uh, Herbert George. So they're probably, come on, Herbert, give us another science fiction uh, epic. Don't give us this. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of publish your, your your kind of bike cycling kind of stuff, but yeah, come on, come on, give us give us more of of what they want. It, it's possibly true, actually, I, and you know, not knowing much about the publishing industry of the time, it's certainly, I suspect that having written War of the Worlds at the same time, that that certainly got attention and and probably drowned out really the 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 focus on his other works and. Of course, that led to publishers picking up all his other science fiction. Um, although I think it's fair to say that Wells's interest moved on shortly after that. So in the early 1900s, he was writing other works of, of predictive science fiction and, and so on, and uh, um, other social commentaries. And he never really went back into cycling. It, it was kind of done by then. I think you know he, he, he probably there's, there's some evidence to show he continued in his interests for a while, but uh, by the sort of early you know, sort of, uh, 1910s and so on his interests had moved on and he uh, was not really talking about cycling anymore right so the book um, The Wheels of Chance what is it about uh, give us a, a short summary of the of the book itself sure so um, the book is a, is a work of fiction and it follows uh, the adventures of a man uh, called Hoop Driver Mr Hoop Driver we never know his first name. And he's a draper's assistant, uh, which is a bit of a drudgery of a job uh, in Putney. Um, and he's got 10 days holiday. And he decides that in his 10 days holiday, he is going to go on a cycling tour of the south of England. He's got an old second-hand machine um, that uh, he's just learning to ride. And uh, he sets off uh, on an August morning. Uh, and on the way, he bumps into um, some other characters, a lady, uh, and other followers, uh, and there's a an adventure that follows, let's say, uh, that uh, that um, leads him uh, to uh, to have an interesting time cycling onto the south coast and then west into Hampshire. So, what genre of book is it? Is it a travelogue? Is it a uh, romance? Is it a, a detective story? Is it a thriller? Is it a uh I don't know. What is it? It's a bit of everything. Um, you, you, you know, it's a travelogue in the way that Wells wrote in real places uh, and real experience. Um, he had, um, uh, you know, good knowledge of pretty much everything that he wrote into the book. So you can read it as a travelogue, uh, travelogue, um, but it's also very much a social commentary uh, about cycling and the impacts it has on social change particularly in terms of women and their ability to break free of some of the restraints that they had at the time socially and it's also a romance and a comedy and a satire uh, all at once it's it's uh, um, uh, yeah a bit of bit of bit of everything do you think in any way it was autobiographical to some degree it is because Wells himself was a draper's assistant and he absolutely hated that job um, you know, he's on record saying it was, the, it was the worst time of his life pretty much he, he really detested working in the draper's shop uh, and he, he wrote that experience into the character of Mr Hooper he was, he's finding his life very um, uninspiring and looking to have an adventure and, uh, and this is certainly, certainly something that was put into that um, and at the same time, you know, Wells himself wrote in his experience of learning how to ride a bike and his experience of bike, bicycle riding into the book through Hoop Driver as well. There are plenty of people who read books. I mean, um, there are millions of people who, for example, read um, The Grapes of Wrath, for example, but they don't go off on a quest across America. <laughs> um, what, what was it that uh, made you think, ooh, hang on a second... I could follow in the the paths of this uh, this man, this character, 
and recreate this uh, this journey. Uh, just it's, it's a, the circumstances were perfect for it because I discovered the book, read it, realised that both the start and particularly the finish of the journey that's described in the book was not very far from where I lived at all. I had some time uh, available to to do a tour, and it looked like I could fit this journey in. I could follow in the footsteps, or sorry, the wheel tracks of uh, of Hoop Driver, go and visit the places described, um, and sort of experience the book through through real life 126 years after it was written and I could do that by taking one train from my uh, from where I live up to London uh, and the finish would only be an hour's ride from my house and I thought why why wouldn't I do that <laughs> why won't, why not so it starts in Putney and it finishes in it finishes in the new forest at the Rufus Stone but it uh, starts in Putney it heads south towards the uh, the south coast via Guildford and uh, Midhurst uh, ending up eventually at Bognor Regis um, and then it heads west uh, going through Winchester uh, as far west as Blandford Forum uh, before heading back east again and finishes up at the Rufus Stone in the new forest okay and if 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 you were if you were to describe that route to anybody Without without having any um, knowledge of the the book that H. G. Wells wrote, what would their reaction be in terms of the a cycle route of merit? Is that is that a good route to take? Putney to the the New Forest. It's certainly an interesting start point. It's it, it's not somewhere I would have ever put on my list of, of places to start uh, being Putney, but. Um, Actually, you know, heading to the south coast, that's not an unusual thing for people to do from London, absolutely. And um, the, other lo- the other areas is almost traditional cycling country. You've got the, uh, you've got the, um, the, 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 the very bucolic um, Hampshire uh, countryside, um, bits of Dorset and the New Forest itself. It's still today a place that's well worth exploring by bike. And so for, I think if you were to read it, you would recognise... Um, as a cycle tourist or, or a cyclist, you would certainly recognise the attraction of doing that route today. So you headed up to Putney. Um, I understand you did it at the week, the same week as Wimbledon. Um, not a great idea, but uh, uh, so you were in southwest London in uh, in what in July, early July of this year. It, it was uh, early July. In fact, it was the. Um, uh, the, the day I actually went up to London was the day Boris Johnson resigned, so that was ah. that was an interesting. Uh, the day, lift. the day I was the, standing outside the, the right. Westminster Hotel. <laughs> yes. In yes. Uh, in in Le Touquet. Ah, right. Yeah, that day. What, I what a great moment! Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and and, and, and I, well, I mean, I, I took the train. It was uh, I was getting off at Wimbledon because it was the nearest point to the start, and I hadn't realised it was Wimbledon at the time. So yeah, the train was a bit full, to say the least. Um, although on the plus side. Um, there was another chap on the train with a bicycle and we did get talking and uh, we were talking about uh, sort of uh, our, our bucket list and um, we both agreed that uh, we both wanted to go the, the Great Divide in America uh, and that was, uh, it was a good discussion to have. So you, there's always a plus. <laughs> so you, 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 you arrive in Putney, now what's your plan here? Are you, are you what, are you camping, are you taking hotels, are you... Are you staying with friends? Are you, how, how, how is this going to pan out? How many days are you envisaging? Uh, how many kilometres are you going to plan to do per day? Yeah, so it's 260 miles in total to the Rufus Stone, uh, plus another 13 home. I had five days to do it in, so I, I thought that was pretty comfortable. It's, uh, it involved a couple of days of 60 miles um, uh, and some short, slightly shorter days as well. Um, three nights of camping and uh, one night in, uh, in a... Um, a bunkhouse in Guildford as well and I reckon that was doable what I didn't do um, was properly check the hope profile and that, that, that was a bit of a challenge from from part of the ride uh, for me anyway okay. um, so just talk about the what five stages that you did yeah yeah so um, starting in Putney um, so the first day was from uh, Putney to Guildford um, only 30 miles so it was a late start that day Putney to Guildford uh, the next day, Guildford down to uh, Bognor Regis, but then back up to Chichester um, for, the, for the overnight. Uh, and then it was Chichester to Stockbridge, um, and then Stockbridge to uh, Blandford Forum, and Blandford Forum home. And that mirrored exactly what, what, what the story of well, of the Wheels of Chance yeah, was? Yeah, pretty close. So the first day, certainly, um, an overnighting in, in Guildford. But after that, I was starting to overtake the narrative of the book. So, for example, 
hoop driver takes two days to get from Guildford to Bognor Regis. Um, but then on the other side, when he gets to Bognor Regis, he elopes in the night <laughs> with, a, with a lady. Um, did you, did you uh, do that? West, I, I didn't do that, no. no. My, my, my adventures were not quite as exciting in those, those regards, so I probably should explain. Did you consider it? I did. I did actually. Um, Have you told your wife? <laughs> I considered maybe riding in the night. I think I was out, but no, I wasn't. Wasn't doing that. No. So, so you know, early on in the story, uh, Hoop Driver comes across uh, or meets a, uh, what's described as the young lady in grey, who's a key character in the book. Who's a, a young lady also riding a bicycle, and um, it, it does precipitate a whole string of adventures. Adventures, and as I was riding through Surbiton, where this happens, thinking, I wonder which side road she would have come out on in this story, trying to work out, you know, if I could identify the same place. Um, I did have a close encounter with a Honda driven by a lady, a grey Honda driven by a lady, but uh, that was as close as it came <laughs> to, to that kind of adventure. <laughs> so. Um Continue with your narrative of the of the days where I kind of I kind of interrupted you there. Yeah, no, sure. So, um, so, so yeah. you're eloping at two o'clock in the morning from from Bognor Regis. Oh, the, in Hoop, yes. So, so Hoop Driver, yeah, he 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 um, he elopes with a lady at two o'clock in the morning. I should probably go back a step because um, there's an awful lot happens in the story between. Uh, particularly between Guildford and uh, and the Bognor Regis on the south coast, where um, various other characters come into the book. There's a man um, who uh, is similarly dressed to Hoop Driver in, in tweeds, uh, also cycling a bicycle, um, who turns out to be pursuing the lady himself. And he's a bit of a cad. He's a married man, um, but he wants uh, wants this young lady to marry him instead, or, or, or marry him. Um, and Hoop Driver kind of gets embroiled in this this this, uh, this this relationship between the two. He sees himself as a bit of a um, an, at one stage an investigator trying to work out what's going on, and then then latterly when he kind of works out the the ins and outs of this man's intentions, he, be, he becomes a bit more of a knight errant, a guardian if you like, and, and feels very protective. So once they get to uh, Bognor Regis. Um, Hoop driver offers to help the lady escape her situation, and they elope in the night, as as you mentioned. And he and he actually gets away on this cad's bicycle. He he upgrades, if you like, quite considerably from his old clunker uh, to a very nice new machine, and off they go uh, westwards. And um, what follows is a is a tale of uh, tall tall stories. Um, on the part of Hoop Driver, who doesn't want to admit that he's a draper, he wants to make himself out to be somebody of high social standing to impress the girl or perhaps just suggest that he is of her similar social class. Um, and at the same time, uh, the girl whose, whose name we've now known is Jessie, her stepmother and a party of other people are in pursuit. And uh, they're, you know, they're, over the course of the, the, the following miles, they get closer and... Uh, until the the end. <laughs> it, it struck me when you were talking about this earlier that um, this is a story that perhaps he he kind of had big ideas about, but it it kind of peters out towards the end. And there's the problem is he didn't have a good ending. I think that's exactly right, and I think that's probably shown in, in the the first the, all the descriptors and all the, all of the uh, the social commentary on cycling is packed into the first uh, third of the book, um, and. He didn't even give it a happy ending. He didn't, he didn't. didn't really give it a happy ending. No, it was it was definitely not. So, uh, you know, I was thinking all the way through as I read it that uh, well, we, we, how is he going to pull this off? How is he going to um, get the girl? Which is what you'd expect, yeah. really. But it doesn't. So, the, the the journey ends at the roof of stone in the New Forest, where everyone catches up with uh, with our, our, our two um, with Hoop Driver and Jesse, and. Um, He's told in no uncertain terms that he's not suitable. He's just not the right class. He's not the right thing for her, and uh, it, it will will happen no more. And um, they part ways, um, and he heads off home uh, yeah. without the girl, but with a nice bicycle. You see, that would that would never get you a Netflix series now. It would be a bit of a bit letdown, wouldn't it? And yeah. and I think I think for, for if I was to uh, give the book uh, uh, you know a, a rating out of five stars. It, it would be two or three. It's not his best work. Mm. The, the interesting bit really is around the, the cycling and the social mm. commentary. Yeah. Now, there's something we haven't mentioned, and that's that in the in the version that you were using uh, to follow, there are also illustrations in there. 
and one thing that you were doing was going round and um, trying to find those places that were depicted in those illustrations. Yeah, exactly, and that's what, one of the key things that made doing the journey really, really interesting. So the 1913 edition of the book uh, that I, you can find online, I, um, which I found, has illustrations in it by a chap called uh, J. Ayton Symington, I believe it is, I might be getting that wrong. Um, and when I looked at the drawings, I thought these are pretty realistic. You know, normally you might expect an illustrator to take a scene in a book and form something of it that was uh, uh, that, that, that met that description from their imagination. But there was some element of reality to it, and it didn't take a lot of of research. Although I didn't want to overdo it because that would have taken out the point of the trip. But a little bit of research on Google showed that they were drawings of real places. So what I wanted to do as part of the journey was to locate these these lo these drawings where these drawings were made and see what changed and take a photo of my bike and uh, and of the place and um put the two side by side and yeah. see see what they're like i'm reminded of rob ends this talk earlier when he was talking about uh doing uh something somewhere in the lake district and he as a, as a slight aside he mentioned his photographer he said, oh, that's my photographer, because obviously Rob writes for um, cycling magazines. Mm. So perhaps H.G. Wells had his, had his, um, his, his, his artist. Um, perhaps yeah. they actually did do this trip back in, I... back, in the, no, back in the day when it was published. Perhaps they, yeah. they actually set off together and he, he, he kind of wrote his narrative or sketched out his narrative. And, and at the same time, there was uh, his artist sketching out the pictures. It's possible. I, th I think the, the, the illustrator is, is kind of is a professional book illustrator. I think he was probably commissioned by the publisher to do it. I suspect it was a few years after the book was written, so not quite in the 1890s. It may have been in the early 1900s, although I guess not much would have changed. Um, but it's certainly clear that he followed the route. He, he, did, he did what I did. He followed the route and the story. And, uh, and for the most part, I think, maybe not everywhere, um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that was again that element of realism is really sort of what what added that interest to me. Yeah, perhaps uh, perhaps sales were flagging and they needed uh, yeah. the local people to buy their books back. I remember um, uh, seeing a very old film archive of a um, a, group, a very large group of people back in the early days of cinematography uh, outside the local cinema in the town where I live. And uh, I asked the chap who at Yorkshire Film Archive, you know, why? What was what was the point in that? There was nothing happening at the time. And he said yes, but all those people, all those people in that picture, in that film, then went to the cinema to watch themselves yeah. on the film. So perhaps it was something similar. Perhaps mm. all these people who lived in the places that he visited, thinking, oh, hang on a second, that's a, a book about where I live. I should go out and buy it. Well, it's interesting, though, because uh, a significant part of the book is based in Midhurst um, in Sussex, and that is a town where he Wells himself lived or, uh, and, and had some formative years. He went to school at, uh, at Midhurst. He was later a teacher at that school. He worked in a chemist's shop there and lodged in, a, in, in a various places in the town. So he wrote that town into the wheels of chance as a, as a place where some significant events happen and he's also mentioned it in some other works I believe as well certainly certainly formative years but I found the I went to um, the uh, the tourist information uh, office at Midhurst and they had pam a pamphlet on HG Wells a famous Midhurst resident um, and nowhere in the pamphlet does it mention Wheels of Chance at all. Um, mentions lots of other works, but the, the one that firmly sets Midhurst in the story doesn't even get a mention, which kind of reflects really, I think, the fact that it may have been missed out in terms of the... Uh, or, or left behind under, under his other works in terms of popularity. But you do remind me, though, there, is, there was a film made of the book in the 20s, apparently. I've not, I've not managed to see it. Um, it was called The Wheels of Chance, so I'm, I'm still on the lookout for that. Does it still exist? I think I think it exists in some copy. I've, I've seen reference on the internet to a screening of it at a specialist uh, film club some years back, so there must be copies, but there's there's not one on YouTube that I can find or you, elsewhere. Well, you, you want to try the BFI, the British Film Institute, because uh, mm. um, you would think that perhaps the film and the book were not of pedigree, but certainly the, the person behind them would be worthy of interest. Mm. So presumably yeah, I might, there I might is follow a copy. That one up. There is a copy somewhere. 
It would be um, intriguing to see how they uh, how they filmed it. Yeah, and how successful were you? Because you you, t- you you took pictures trying to um, recreate the images that were appeared in that that version of the book. How successful were you in finding those places and then taking the images? Um, it was actually worked out better than I expected. I, I was I was. Wouldn't, I was prepared to, to maybe find one or two places or, or discover that they'd changed out of all recognition, but uh, um, there were some challenges. So some of the locations were changed in the book, so he had put them in different places, but um, they did exist. Um, and, of course, one of the biggest biggest challenges was the, the change to the road network. Uh, so in 1896, Wells put the characters cycling down the road to Portsmouth uh, which is now the A3 and of course at the time it was a gravel road um, very easy to cycle along in that regard but now it's uh, basically a motorway for for all intents and purposes so whilst I could still cycle alongside it on a a cycle path and I use that word advisedly because it was quite challenging uh, very overgrown and, and strewn with glass and bits of plastic and things but you could you could still do much of the route which itself was quite quite a surprise to find um, but when I got to the locations that had been used in the illustrations yeah actually you, you, there were to some extent fairly unchanged um, albeit with different road layouts uh, to, or, and, and added, added roundabouts here and there and, uh, um, and things like that but uh, so yeah I was fairly successful um, there's maybe one or two places where it was clearly in the imagine, imagination of the, uh, the illustrator um, uh, and certainly towards the end of the ride um, but for that first stretch from Putney down to Midhurst uh, yeah, very faithful And what was the place which was the the easiest to, to recreate in terms of it, it really not having changed since he did his uh, fictitious ride and you did your 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 real ride uh, Guildford High Street is almost identical um, to the illustration in the book um, you know, almost down to the cobbles in the street, although I think they've probably been replaced. Um, and there's a bridge just outside of Cobham, just before the roundabout where the A3 joins, um, which I almost rode, rode over without realising it was the same place, actually. Um, but uh, the bridge parapet, uh, the house in the background, all uh, still the same. Uh, those, those are the two sort of memorable ones. But, and in Midhurst itself... Uh, the old water mill is still there, but it's because it's, it's hidden behind a tree. You can't really see it as well anymore. Um, but and, yeah. and, and were there any places which were just disappointingly, depressingly, completely wiped out by modernity? Pretty, well, yeah. I, I would say the stretch between Chichester to Portsmouth um, in the book, you know, the characters decide on the spur of the moment to go up Portsdown Hill for the view. Um, you can still do that, but it's a bit of a challenge because of the motorway that runs along that area. It's uh, it's not a stretch of great beauty, <laughs> I would say. Um, but that's only kind of a small part. I would think that um, even coming out of Putney, uh, I was apart from the, some stretches alongside the A3. It, it was actually quite quite enjoyable. And you you come across places like Kingston upon Thames, very nice, very pleasant. Not that much changed, I suspect, from the time of before. Um, and once you get into the lanes and the little little back straight lanes uh, out of uh, throughout Sussex and um, through Hampshire and Dorset, you could be pretty much back in that time. If the road was only covered in a bit of dust and gravel, it would be it would be identical, I think. Did you find yourself following any modern day cycling routes? Yeah, there was a few that coincided. Um, not not really from London down to the south coast. It kind of didn't follow any any sort of sustrans routes or mart cycle routes as such but uh, on the south coast it followed ncn2 um and from time to time it joined other cycle routes and trailways and so on so it was quite easy to create the route uh on segregated cycle paths and paths that were 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 suitable for cycling if you if you like um and i think in many parts you, you could really follow closely the route that was described in the book uh, you didn't have to take much in terms of a detour. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was surprisingly easy, actually. Yeah. So you've done that particular book, H.G. Wells, mm-hmm. uh, The Wheels of Chance. Do you think it's a, a good model to follow, to, to find these long-lost, forgotten books? I'm sure there are others out there, and try and recreate the roots. Um, do you have any in mind? 
that you could perhaps follow in future? Yeah, it's. I, I like the blend of that historical historical um, record and uh, and adventure as well. So there are a few. I mean, there's there's another H.G. Wells book that I intend to do, The War of the Worlds. That's very well described in terms of places and, and so on. Um, so that'll that'll have that'll be on my list of to do at some point. Um, but it's not. There aren't that many others. I have been looking. Um, there's the sequel to Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome, Three Men on a Bummel, which is about a cycling holiday uh, in Germany. I don't really know the details of it yet, but um, that's one I'm going to look into. Um, but, yeah, actually, I, I think yeah, maybe maybe now there is a market for that kind of thing, perhaps, that kind of travelogue fiction where if you had a story that you could read and enjoy and then go and actually follow and see the places um you know i'm sure i can't be the only one who's interested in that and if there are any out there i'd be really interested to to know um uh, i think i I do know a few modern works that do that but the subject matter probably doesn't lend itself very much to to that kind of uh of of following um and I'm, i'm now kind of really conscious of it and i'm looking for it in books that i read is does this lend itself to a visit somewhere it is nice to have a... I mean, again, to mention Rob Ainsley, he was talking earlier about all the obscure routes that he's done and the motivations, whether they be point to point, whether they be following rivers, whether they be following places that rhyme, um, Yarmouth to Barmouth, uh, places like that, some quite comical. Um, it is nice to have a ulterior motive behind your whimsical cycle tour. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and I love those kind of things. And it... it it, it probably, in, in many respects, it probably did inspire me to look into this one because I was aware of some of those cycle, the cycles that he's done through previous cycle touring festival, uh, the online versions and so on. So there is that. And I think, and I have done a few day rides to places that have got historical and literary uh, links. Um, you know, for example, I, I've ridden to visit the church lynch gate that's made out of uh, the timbers of HMS Thunderer that took part in the, um, I'm going to get this wrong probably, but I think it was the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, and that's also a boat that's mentioned in one of my favourite book series by Patrick O'Brien, the Master and Commander series. So it was great to go and sit in that lynch gate and touch the timbers and say this was part of a warship that not only had a significant historical importance, it was also in this story, mentioned in the story, that this character is possibly, you know, you know, touch the same timber or, or what have you um and in fact as part of the ride i did for the for the wheels of chance i did do a little side trip to the uh the chesapeake mill in wickham in hampshire which is made from the timbers of the uss chesapeake which was captured by the british in the war of 1812 um so again it, historically interesting and also part of the uh the canon of uh aubrey Matterin stories that patrick mm. o'brien wrote so yeah and, and cycling is a is a great way to do these kind of things because you you know if you're in a car, uh, then clearly you whiz past these places. You never have time to reflect upon the significance. Um, you never have time to just reflect in that internal monologue that's taking place in your brain. Um, but whereas on a bike, you just kind of have lots of time to think about what you're doing, where you're going, and the significance of, uh, of, of, of what you happen to have achieved. Yeah, absolutely. It's the pace of travel's perfect, isn't it, for, for, for that reflective thought and to take in your surroundings and to consider it in the context of, of what you're... Well, if you've got a purpose of going through that area, what, what that purpose is. You know, I've, I've, you know, the attraction to me of these kind of cycle tours is always that you go at a pace where you're uh, going slow enough to, to see things of interest and stop if you need to, um, uh, and really get to get a feel for the countryside you're work- going through, but at the same time you're going fast enough to go from quite distinct areas in, in one day. You can you could you know move out of you know, forested woodland of one type into heathland to urban areas and back again, and they've all got a different character and they've all got a different feel. And I, that's I love that kind of pace of change. It's it's uh, it's what draws me to to riding. You know I'm not a fast rider. I, I, I think my, my average speed is somewhere just shy of 10 miles an hour, which I think is about perfect for, for travel, uh, as you say, just to, to really get to f- understand a place and, uh, and um, enjoy it. Are there any particular quotes from the book that you think 
Yeah. Yeah, H.G. Wells has really nailed it in that particular line. Oh, the book is full of quotable lines. Um, you press me for some, uh, some ones I can pull out of my head. Um, there's a great sentiment given in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in the book around the, f- the, the enjoyment and freedom of cycle touring. The character sort of shouts out uh, in, in, as he starts off, the whoop for freedom and, freedom and adventure, which is, which is brilliant. But actually, uh, what, what's really worth seeking out in it and, and, and maybe having in your back pocket for good quotable lines um, is around the the cycling the reality of cycling um his commentary on the you know the nose the human nose being an unnecessary exuberance that causes all sort of dismay because it starts to run and then you have to take your hand off the handlebar to get a handkerchief and it immediately starts to precipitate the, the, an uncontrolled dismount from the bike for example um I, 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 off the top of my head i probably struggle to get them but i've got a i've got my uh, kindle note is full of quotes and i think the one that sticks out and it, it, which which made me laugh out loud is um uh, wells describes a, a scene in which uh the uh the cad of the story he realizes he's been bested by hoop driver and they've eloped off into the night in bognor regis and he walks across the floor of a dining room <clears throat> underneath of which all the staff can hear him moving uh, and uh, and they sort of Wells writes in the book that there's a uh, interlude of conversational eyebrows, and that just uh, set me. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Thank you to Tristan for taking the time last weekend to sit down and record that conversation. If you go online, you can probably find a copy of the H.G. Wells book Wheels of Chance to download, and there are copies available on Amazon. Although I think it's now out of print. If you'd like to find out more about Tristam's trip, you can visit his website, which is tristamjames.com. Tristam has written a few books, including a few about the shipping forecast. And I think Tristam James is his pen name. Tristam Newey is his real name. But anyway, his website, tristamjames.com. He's also on Twitter, and you'll find him on Twitter at tristam underscore james. If you want to get in contact with him now, next episode, episode number 61, I'm going to be interviewing somebody who goes cycle touring on a small wheeled bike. Not sure if it's a Brompton or not, but uh, I'm recording that next weekend. If you'd like to be featured yourself on the uh, podcast, then get in touch. You can do so via the website cyclingeurope.org forward slash contact or via social media at Cycling Europe or via email if you email podcast at cyclingeurope.org. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, then please visit cyclingeurope.org forward slash support and any contribution you can make is very much appreciated. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you to Rob Ainsley for the music. Hopefully that will continue into the future. And I shall see you for episode 61 of the Cycling Europe podcast coming soon to a podcast provider near you. Happy cycling.